Well, good morning. Good morning. So that was, that might be too much. Is that too much? Not too much? Okay. Um, uh, that was Lindsay Lohan um, before she was crazy. I don't know how to say that. Before she struggled. That would be more gracious with it. Anyway, but that was, I remember seeing that movie and thinking, wow, what a great, she's a great little actress. And then, I don't know what happened. Anyway, um, so today we're going to talk about the blame game. So we've been talking about boundaries. If you've missed the, the message series, fear not, because um, I'm going to recap at the end, so you'll just have to listen really carefully to the last sermon. So you have to come in the next few weeks and you'll get to hear it, but... We've been talking about putting boundaries in place, and here's what I know about this. This is a big deal. This is probably the biggest deal, but here's what's funny about it. I'm not going to say a thing today that you don't already know. Isn't that good to know? So you should just go home now. <laughs> I, I'm really not. I, I, but here's the deal. The things I'm going to talk about today, you know, they're just difficult to do. Because here's the deal. When you begin to say no to people, whether it's your children whether it's a two-year-old or whether it's a 60-year-old, when you begin to say, you know, I've always done this for you, but now I'm not, or I'm not going to let you have that behavior anymore, or I'm not going to let you talk to me that way anymore, or I'm not willing any longer. I know I've always let you do this, but I'm not willing any longer to let you do this. When you begin to put boundaries in place and say, you know, I just don't have time to do that, or I just can't do that, or that's just not on my priority list right now, or whatever, people will have a fit. And just like her screaming, they may be smart enough not to scream at you, but there are ways that they will try to make you feel bad and blame you even for you saying no. Now, if you've missed part of this series, I want you to know what boundaries are. Boundaries are basically in your life looking and saying, this is me and this is you. This is what I'm responsible for and this is what you're responsible for. I'm not responsible for your feelings. I'm not responsible for making you happy. I'm not responsible for all this. But I'm responsible for what God wants me to do. And so I'm going to give you this, the summary of the sermon here real quick, uh, the message today, because if you're here and you need a nap because the time changes mess with you, you can listen to this part. And then later, if grandma says, what was the sermon about? Or, you know, somebody said you went to church and then they say, what was it about? You'll be able to tell them and you can nap the rest of the time. So here it is. When you give people boundaries, you need to know that they may react. They may complain. But you cannot spend your life trying to make everyone happy. You have to do what God wants you to do. Amen. Now in that, here's what I want you to know. For some of you, because you've never had good boundaries, you said yes to people that you should have said no to, and you got burned out, and so you quit doing anything. Because you're now afraid to do anything because you're afraid, you know, the only time you say no is when you get angry. And here's the other thing I realized. Christians are notorious about not only having poor boundaries, but about being resentful. And doing things because they feel like they have to do them, doing them with the wrong motivation while thinking they're doing them for God, and then being angry. And so, you know, every once in a while somebody says, Eric, why are some of the nastiest people in churches, not our church, not, our, not this church, other than the pastor here, everybody else. So, so, you know, why are the, and I said, I think what it is, is they have said yes to things that they shouldn't be saying yes to. And so they're resentful. So they're teaching a class or doing something and they're saying, I'm doing this for God. And the truth is they're doing it because they feel obligation. Now, here's the deal. You may still do the exact same thing, but if you will check your motivation and make sure it's for God, we're going to go into this a little bit later in the sermon, but it'll change even how you receive things. Even when you, you'll find joy in the things you, and that's really the purpose of boundaries is so that you can find joy in life. Some of you are not saying yes to the things you should, so, you, so you're not even, in, you don't serve anybody, 
So you never get the joy of seeing somebody blessed or seeing God work in somebody's life, and you wonder why you're miserable and you're stuck? Well, because life revolves around you. So we're going to look at some things. Here's where I want to start today, and we're going to start with this idea. Why do people blame us for our boundaries? Why do they blame us for our boundaries? And we're going to look at 2 Timothy um, chapter 3 to start this out, just to give you some motivation. So here it is. Number one, this is probably the, the, the big one, okay? They care only about themselves and their things. Paul is warning young pastor Timothy, and he's saying to him, here's some things, and he's talking about the end times, and when the end times come, but truthfully, I, I, this is nothing new. Here's what he says. People will be lovers of themselves. Time out right there. <clears throat> we have so many ways to show that now. We have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, low chat, high chat, your chat, my chat, right? And, and, and we're able to do things to even promote ourselves. We're able to even do things that to try to make ourselves look better than we really are to kind of do that. And it starts out with this idea that they'll be lovers of themselves. And so the idea is that even when they do something for someone else, they're looking to gain something. Did you, and by the way, this is talking about people in churches. I'm going to tell you something about this part because you'll notice that these three points say they, but you, you might, I mean, just it could happen that while you're reading some of these, you think, oh, I do that. I know you don't because you're Christians, but maybe one of your friends, <laughs> right? And so when we look at this, don't just think, oh, yeah, they're lovers of themselves. The truth is, guys. We all struggle with selfishness. We live in a selfish world with selfish gravity, and the world is always pulling you towards selfishness. It says people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Do I need to go into details about that one? We're in the wealthiest country in the world, and it is never enough. Do you realize that our entire society is driven by them selling you stuff? Do you remember after 9-11? I don't know if you remember this. I remember after September 11th. Do you know what they came out and said? Go buy stuff. What? That was one of the things that was in all that. Go buy stuff. Don't hurt the economy. Why? Because we're so driven by spending money that it's become our culture. And advertising, everything. They want to, tell, they want to make you just a little bit discontent with your car. They, they want you to think that if you're going to impress, this is the new commercial I just saw yesterday. If you're going to impress your new father-in-law, you've got to have a car that can park itself parallel park. Which, I don't know about you, when's the last time you really had to parallel park? Yeah. I actually did two days ago. But, uh, you know, most, right? And, and, and so that's the new thing. Like, oh, well, you're going to impress the family because you don't have to actually parallel park. You just pull your car up, push a button, and it parallel parks it. You need that car. You need, you need to spend an extra twenty thousand dollars to parallel park. Couldn't you just pay somebody ten bucks every time you want to pay a parallel park? Say, hey, you park my car. I don't know. But what? We got to become a little discount. We don't have enough cup holders. We don't have enough TV channels. How many TV channels do we need to be bored with? There's nothing on. There's still nothing on. Remember when you had four channels and nothing was on? I have a thousand. You're like nothing's on. You watch a movie that you watch fifty times, even though you're paying for cable every month. I'm just okay. Sorry. That has nothing to do with the sermon. And, all right. and then it says, lovers of money, boastful. And I love this word in the Greek. It means big words. It means somebody who tries to use superfluous words in order to make themselves sound superior to you. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> By the way, I had a principal one time, I'll never forget. He used words, and I knew the definitions to the words, and he used them improperly, but they were big, so he just assumed nobody knew what he was talking about. And, and I was the idiot who questioned him, like, I think that's the wrong meaning for that word. And that didn't work there long. All right, proud. They're proud. They're abusive. Why? Why abusive? Because if you only care about yourself, why not just use everybody? Disobedient to parents? My sister had six of her ten children here last night. I looked at them, I said, I'm getting all of you in trouble. To which my nephew said, yeah, Uncle Eric, we're mad at you now. 
I told him I didn't like him that much either. <laughs> no, he was kidding. Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. When's the last time you complained about a meal because it didn't have enough whatever? You know how you become grateful? You begin to appreciate what you've been given. Do you know why people go camping? I don't, but, but do you know why? I really think that part of it is, if you can be miserable for a couple of days, then when you come home, you're like, oh, air conditioning, food, there's no dirt in my food, this is new, no bugs in my house, right? Or only a few bugs in my house, right, or whatever. They care only about themselves. Now, I want to tell you how this works out for me, because I, I tend to think, you know, Eric Brooklyn, too, is pretty unselfish. <laughs> he just, just thinks of other people all the time. I, just, I, I have these great conversations with myself about that, you know. You're just thoughtful, you know, Eric, you're just being thoughtful. And then I get in line at Publix. And, and I get to the front of the line, and there's two or three people, and I get to the front of the line, and the lady all of a sudden pulls out one of those coupon books, like books. Like books. <laughs> And starts going, well, let me see what I got here. I got this, and I and then I go. <laughs> you know, lady, I liked you till just now. And isn't it amazing how suddenly you hate somebody? Have you ever, you ever noticed how quickly you can go from loving somebody to be like, you jerk, and you don't even know them. You don't even know. You're driving down the highway, and here we go. <laughs> You people struggle, don't you? <laughs> You're driving down the highway, right? And and what and somebody just doesn't see you and cuts you off, and you instantly think that person's an idiot. You don't know anything about them. You you have no history. You have no prior experience. You don't know anything. Now, if they have a couple bumper stickers, you might use those as your evidence, right? Like, well, of course they voted for them. Well, I should have known. <laughs> Oh, they're a Gator, no wonder. I see why they're a bad driver, right? I'm sorry, Gator fans. I'm highly on because your season's so bad. I'm really sorry. By the way, we'll be praying for Gator fans later in the service. You just come up. Number two, they don't want us to stand in their way. That's us, let's be honest. We don't like people to be in our way. I don't like the coupon people. You're in my way. You need your own line. Come here when it's not busy. Just come in here when I'm not here. That's all right. <laughs> you ever go to get in line, somebody gets in front of you right before, and you instantly find yourself aggravated? Really? Really? Have you ever found yourself in a hurry and then realized you're not in a hurry? You ever been driving up the highway and you're like, I gotta get to, and then you're, you realize, okay, number one, I'm speeding. Number two, why am I speeding? I, I don't have it be there. I mean, that's, that's how bad we've gotten. We, we are just pushing and pushing even when we don't need to. It says they're without love. They're unforgiving. You know what unforgiving says? It says, I have it all together and you don't. When you can't forgive someone, oh, by the way, there's people who I know in your heart, you don't feel like they deserve forgiveness. But, he, but here's the incredible thing. You were forgiven a huge debt by God. And so he says, you have to forgive. So if you don't want to, you still have to. So one of the negative things in the end times is that people are unforgiving. They're slanderous. Let me just use a different word for slanderous just to mess with everybody. Gossip. When you talk bad about somebody, all you're doing is trying to put them down to probably make yourself feel better about something that happened or to just feel better about yourself. Without self-control. Brutal. This word brutal is savage like an animal. Listen, we had Saul Brute, a guy went through a truck down a lane, a bike lane in New York and killed all kind of people. I don't know what you call that other than savage. You don't care about anybody. You just kill everybody. Not lovers of the good. Then number three, they desire only praise and pleasure. And this is what often we can struggle with as Christians, I believe, too often. It says treacherous, treacherous, rash, conceited. By the way, this word conceited means surrounded by smoke. It's the idea that you're faking it. You're pretending you're a little better than you are. You're pretending you, you've got it together a little more. And you know how you know when you're doing that? 
when you look down on somebody else. When you think, oh, I would never do that. I would never be that. That sneaks in, that idea of conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, which means these people are doing things that look Christian. But denying its power have nothing to do with such people. Now let me tell you something that will happen if you're in church for any length of time. If you go out of your way to serve in church, this will be tested. Because let's just say you go and you help at the door. And you open the door and you hand people bulletins. You open the door and you hand people bulletins. At some point, somebody will go, I don't need a bulletin. And in your brain, you'll think, jerk. <laughs> no, you won't, right? You'll say, oh, they have a bad day. I'm going to pray and ask Jesus for help. Right? No, no. You'll, and, and then in your brain, you'll think, they don't realize. I go out of my way to do this for them. One of my favorite stories is a guy who up in the nursery years ago. And um, he and his wife were helping and um, he was doing his best, and they changed the baby diaper. The parent came, and the, the baby diaper was apparently nuclear. It was one of these where you need a gas mask and bio suit and everything, right? And so, got the diaper changed, so proud. Gave the baby to the parent, and the parent said, oh, "You put the diaper on backwards." And the parent wanted to go. The, parent who changed it wanted to go get the diaper and give it to them. <laughs> or leave it in their car. Or, you know, whatever. Okay. Put it on the doorstep. Light it on fire. Never mind. That's another story. Okay. Anyway, so. But what happens? Listen. When you do something to serve someone, in your brain you think, I'm doing this for God. And you don't really know that until it's tested. Because the thing is, when everybody's nice to you, you may think you're doing it for God, but you really like, oh, it's nice. They all, gosh, they all like the sermon. Dear Pastor, today when you said this, I didn't like it. I typed that. I don't like you either. <laughs> so what happens when people don't respond the way you want them to? Are you really doing it out of love for God or yourself? And that's where we get messed up so often. And let me tell you something. It's the point at which you're serving, whether you're helping with the sound or whether you're helping on the praise team or whether you're helping with the children or helping in the kitchen, whether you're greeting somebody at the door, whether you come to blow off leaves, whether you paint a wall, whatever you choose to do and you say, I'm going to do this for God, it's the moment where somebody doesn't appreciate you or you feel like I'm the only one who does this. I mean, if you're at the house washing dishes and you think I'm washing dishes for Jesus, but in the back of your mind you start thinking, I'm the only one who throws anything around here, are you really doing it? For God. Now I'm not saying you need to wash it. There's times you should leave the dishes. There's times that you should go get one of your kids and say it's your dish day. Well, I'm washing the dishes. That's all right. The internet's going to quit working. <laughs> so here's pay ways people you like that, huh? Here's ways people respond when we give them boundaries. Number one, they respond in anger. When you say to somebody, "I'm not going to do that," when he said to the lady. Hey, I'm choosing them. She's like, what? And we've all seen this. If you've ever watched Deadliest Catch, if you work at a job site, you know, you'll usually have this when you say no, and it says this in the Bible. A man of great anger will bear the penalty, for if you rescue him, you will only have to do it again. So I just want to give you a couple of illustrations. The first one's this. So, so Kyle um, um, helped run our children's ministry, and... Kyle, when he was learning to walk, there were times, you know, he did the pull up on the chair, and then other times I would help him up, and I would walk with him across the room, right? And then I'd let go of him, and he'd walk a little more, and then he'd fall down, right? And then I'd get him up, right? But at some point, I had to quit helping him up. Because if I, and by the way, he could get mad. <gasps> If I never did that, can I tell you that today, with him being 26, come here, Kyle. Let me take right. If you don't let people fall and fail, if you always rescue everybody, if you allow them to pitch a fit and you give in every time, you will not help them to grow. I mean, they call it the terrible twos, right? How many have heard of the terrible twos? Now, how many of you have heard terrific twos? That's a parent in denial. Okay. Here's what's happening at two, though. Let me tell you what's happening at two. 
that child is trying to find their boundaries. And they're going to push on your boundaries. And if you give in all the time to that two-year-old, then you have a 40-year-old who's a spoiled brat. They'll respond in anger. Why? Because you've always given in when they become angry. If you give in to somebody who's angry, guess what? You'll end up having to start all over. So let's say you help somebody and you always give them money. You give them money, you give them money, you give them money, you give them money. And finally one day you go, you know what? I, I, I can't just keep doing that. You need to start having a budget and living inside your means. I can't just take care of your life and my life. Now, you may have given that person thousands of dollars. At that point, can I tell you what they're going to do? They're not going to say, I just want to thank you for the years that you have gone out of your way for me. How many people think that's what's going to happen? How many people think that they're instead going to have a fit? Anybody, right? They're going to look at you and go, I can't believe it. You've always done that. You should do that. What happened? If you at that point go, well, I guess you're right, then you just start the cycle over. So even though somebody responds, you have to allow them to get angry, allow them to get mad, but continue to do your boundaries. Number two, they try to manipulate us. They'll say, you don't love me. You don't care about me. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire that battle within you? You desire what you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give you do not have because you do not ask God. Sometimes when we bail people out, you know what we're doing? We're keeping them from relying on God. We're keeping them from learning how to grow up on their own. We're, we're not helping people to become responsible for themselves. And whether it's your children, whether it's a boss, whether it's an in-law. Now listen, let me tell you something. If you have a boss and you start to give them boundaries, they have the right to fire you. So you need to understand in that you have to find that balance between boundaries and working. But some of you are in abusive workplaces. And you need to begin looking for other jobs. And then you can say, you know what, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. Number three, they judge us. You know, if you were a good Christian, you would help me. You know, if you were a good Christian, you would do this. If you were a good Christian, you would help in the nursery. By the way, I've sat in churches where that's been said. If you were a good Christian, you would, and whatever their need is at that time becomes, that's what makes you a good Christian. Let me tell you when you're a good Christian. When you just say, God, what do you want me to do? And the good news about God, God's grace is you have his righteousness even when you blow it. If everybody just did what God wanted them to do, we wouldn't have to ever beg anybody. And the truth is, I don't beg people. I figure hey, God's going to work it out. We try to make people aware of needs, but we're never going to say, you're not a good Christian if you don't do that. I might thank you. <laughs> so what's the deal? James 4 says this, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So God knows what you should be doing and not doing, so talk to him about it. Let him deal with it. And when you deal with people, figure out what are you supposed to say yes to and what are you supposed to say no to. Some of you are not doing things you're supposed to be doing and others of you are doing things that you're not supposed to be doing. So figure it out and start to draw those boundaries. Number four, they may threaten and withdraw. Some of us get the silent treatment. You may have a family member that all of a sudden you say, I'm not going to do that for you anymore, and you never hear from them again. That can happen. You can have a friend that when you don't do exactly what they want to, all of a sudden you discover they weren't such a good friend anymore. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. See, when you begin to call people and say, hey, I'm not going to do that anymore, or I'm not going to allow you to treat me that way anymore, when you begin to basically stand up for yourself and put boundaries around yourself, there's times that that brings their misdeeds into the light, and they go, you have a problem. You're not a good Christian. You, I'm not going to talk to you. So let's look now at keys to setting boundaries when we get blamed. Number one, this is the easy, everybody knows this. And this is easy to do with people you don't like that much. Number one, remember, you can't make everyone happy. So that person that you don't like that much, you're like, yeah, I understand, Eric. And then I would name somebody else, and you'd go, oh, them too. Ephesians 5.10 says, find out what pleases the Lord. So here's your little 
reminder. My goal is to please God, not everyone. Now, don't take this the wrong way. I've known Christians who think their goal in life is to make other people miserable. That is not what this says. Your, your job is not, I'm going to make everyone miserable. All I want to do is please God. Well, you're not pleasing God or man at that point. But you have to say, God, what do you want me to do? If you have a child and your child is not learning skills necessary for life, like cleaning their room and brushing them, did you know that kids don't like to take baths? <laughs> did you know if you don't make them take baths, that's bad? But hopefully most of you woke up today and nobody had to remind you to put on deodorant or brush your teeth. Because somebody taught you habits even when you didn't want to do it. Why? Because you realize as a parent, I know what's best for my child. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do even if they don't respond properly. Hey, what if we did the same thing for our friends? What if we did the same thing for other people we love? You know what, God? Help me to know what's best for them. What, what is in the best interest? How I can do what God you want me to do. Number two. This one's very hard. Be willing to lose poor friendships. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. Realize that there are people that when you stand up to them, they will cause more trouble and more problems and more difficulty. You warn them, and then it says have nothing to do with What it means is, hey, sometimes when you deal with somebody and you say, hey, listen, I'm not going to take this behavior, some people will go, fine, and you will never hear from them again. Some people, when you say, I'm no longer going to do this for you, will say, fine. And you have to be willing. Are you willing to do what's right and leave the consequences to God. Charles Stanley says, Obey God and leave the consequences to Him. Are you willing to do that? Good friends love you even when they can't control you. So if they really are a good friend, their job is not to control you. So not only you can't make everyone happy, you have to be willing to lose friendships. Number three, realize you can't rescue everyone. You can't rescue everyone. Some of you in here are such wonderful people. You just want to help everyone. But sometimes the people that you're helping, you're actually hurting. If you have an alcoholic in your family and you continue to give them money to buy alcohol or continue to bail them out of jail, you're actually making their life worse. You have to let them reap the consequences of their behavior, and you have to quit taking the consequences of their behavior on yourself. Realize you can't rescue everyone. I love this verse, Jude 123. It says this, be merciful to those who doubt. So basically, when somebody doubts, be merciful. Understand, hey, they may not believe the same thing. They may not get it all. And then it says, save others by snatching them from the fire. This is really, really funny. Listen to the rest of it. Um, this idea of snatching them from the fire. Have you ever heard somebody say they'll get into heaven with smoke on or they'll get into heaven with their clothes on fire? That's what this means. It's the idea that you barely make it. These are people who are just, they're not quite right, but you're just going to kind of, Help them to get into heaven. Boy, you're, you're smoking still. That's good. You're there, okay? And then it says, to others show mercy. Listen to this. Mixed with fear. Here's what that means. It means you might go to that alcoholic in-law. Or you might go to that person who's struggling with drugs. Or you might go to that person who's really struggling with money. Or, or whatever issue they're struggling with. Or one of your children. And you may say, listen, I love you and I care about you. And I know you feel this way. But you can't keep drinking. You can't keep doing drugs. You can't keep thinking everybody's going to bail you out. You can't keep whatever. You, you know, if it's one of your children. You can't keep leaving your room messy. <laughs> right? Whatever it may be, you know, you, you have that mercy. But then you say, you know, if you continue to do this, you're going to die. Sometimes you have to have that real talk with somebody. Hey, listen, I know you. You'd love to go out and drink and party, but let me tell you, I'm worried about you. If you continue to do that, this is what's going to happen. You, you give a mercy mixed with fear, and then it says, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. It's the idea that you can love a person and still see what they're doing is wrong. I read a book just recently. It was on Amazon the other day. I actually just read it this week. And this, it was disguised as a business book, but it really was a religion book. And basically he said, yeah, there should be no rules. Which sounds really good. 
until somebody breaks your rules. I mean, Outback loves to say no rules, just right. So this afternoon, just drive over there and walk in while everybody's in a line for seating. Just walk in and sit down. And if they come up and say, what are you doing? You say, no rules, just right. And they'll say, well, they call, we're calling the police unless you get some rules, right? Because even they have rules. You don't live in a ruleless society. And, and God has put some things in place for us not to be mean, but to protect us, to keep us from hurting ourselves and each other. Rescuing people will hurt you and them in the long term. All of us know somebody that no matter what they do, somebody bails them out. And we watch, and that person never grows up. They're like the two-year-old that just keeps getting, and they never learn to walk. And they keep bailing them out. We're going to help you this way. We're going to help you that way. We're going to help you this way. And they never learn. They never grow. And number four, last but not least, we need to seek God's glory, not ours. Because the truth is, sometimes we help people because it makes us feel good about us. Sometimes we help people because we feel guilty for not helping. Sometimes we help people just because it's the easiest thing for us to do. But sometimes following God is difficult. Sometimes doing what God wants you to do is difficult, but when you know it's the best thing for them, and when you know it's what God wants you to do, you follow through and you say, God, I know they're not happy, but I know that's what I'm supposed to do. Because so often we want people to fulfill our need for fulfillment or love or acceptance. But did you know God can meet that need? Even when somebody rejects you because you stand up to them and you say, I'm not going to take that anymore, God still accepts you. Philippians 4.19, And my God will provide all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. When our lives point to God, he meets all of our needs. When you give people boundaries, when you say no to them, understand that they're going to react, whether they're four years old or whether they're 80 years old. When you begin to say, I'm not willing to do that anymore. Now you do it in love and you do it in kindness, but when you begin to say no to people, they're not going to like it. But you can't spend your life trying to keep everyone happy. You and I have to do what God wants us to do. So if you're here today and you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, we don't do a formal invitation where people come down the aisle. But I'll be here after the service and you can come up and say, Eric, I want to know what it means to be a Christian. I know about Jesus. I've come to church. But the truth is, I, I don't even really know what it means to be a Christian. Can you talk to me about that? Or maybe you're here today and you're like, I want to be a Christian. Or I used to go to church, but I haven't gone in a long time. And would you just pray for me? I'd be glad to pray for you after the service. Maybe you're here today and as a Christian, as I talked about one of these things, you thought of a situation in your life. Hey, it may not even be somebody that you need to deal with. It may be some way that you're taking advantage of somebody else. Hey, be honest with God about that. And let him begin to deal with you. So you can say, God, I just want to please you and do what you want. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that we can look at scriptures that are thousands of years old, written by people all over the world from all different places. And Father, because of your Holy Spirit, because you wrote it so many years ago through people, that Father, it all of a sudden speaks to our hearts and we realize we've got to take care of something. So Father, I pray for anyone who has to take care of business with you today that they would do it. Father, I pray for that one today who maybe doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. And Lord, as we give our gifts financially today, as we give these offerings and these tithes, I pray, Father, that you would bless each dime that's given to help people here and around the world. As we mail this big package to Puerto Rico this week, I pray that it would help children who need bug spray just to help them. Just the little things. And Father, as we put these boxes together, that you would use them to bless kids, that we would see people come to know you in eternity. Father, thank you that you give us the opportunity to do that here. I pray this will be a place that's full of your light and your peace. Thank you for being here today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please stay seated where our, our ushers are coming. We're going to have a time of giving. You just give what God's put on your heart today.